Things Fall Apart, Chapter 14 Okonkwo was well received by his mother's kinsman in Mbanta. The old man who received him was his mother's younger brother, who was now the eldest surviving member of that family. His name was Uchendu, and it was he who had received Okonkwo's mother twenty and ten years before, when she had been brought home from Umuofia to be buried with her people. <clears throat> Okonkwo was only a boy then, and Uchendu still remembered him crying the traditional farewell, Mother, mother, mother is going. That was many years ago. Today, Okonkwo was not bringing his mother home to be buried with her people. He was taking his family of three wives and their children to seek refuge in the, his motherland. As soon as Uchendu saw him with his sad and weary company, he guessed what had happened and asked no questions. It was not until the following day that Okonkwo told him the full story. The old man listened silently to the end, and then said with some relief, It is a female Ochu and he arranged the requisite rites and sacrifices. Okonkwo was given a plot of ground on which to build his compound, and two or three pieces of land on which to farm during the coming planting season. With the help of his mother's kinsmen, he built himself an obi and three huts for his wives. He then installed his personal god in the symbols of his departed fathers. Each of Uchendu's five sons contributed three hundred seed yams to enable their cousin to plant a farm, for as soon as the first rain came, farming would begin. At last the rain came. It was sudden and tremendous. For two or three moons the sun had been gathering strength till it seemed to breathe a breath of fire on the earth. All the grass had long been scorched brown, and the sands felt like live coals to the feet. Evergreen trees wore a dusty coat of brown. The birds were silenced in the forests, and the world lay panting under the live, vibrating heat. And then came the clap of thunder. It was an angry, metallic, and thirsty clap, unlike the deep and liquid rumbling of the rainy season. A mighty wind arose and filled the air with dust. Palm trees swayed as the wind combed their leaves into flying crests like strange and fantastic coiffure. When the rain finally came, it was in large, solid drops of frozen water, which the people called the nuts of the water of heaven. They were hard and painful on the body as they fell, yet young people ran about happily, picking up the cold nuts and throwing them into their mouths to melt. The earth quickly came to life, and the birds in the forest fluttered around and chirped merrily. A vague scent of life and green vegetation was diffused in the air. As the rain began to fall more soberly, and in smaller liquid drops, children sought for shelter, and all were happy, refreshed, and thankful. Okonkwo and his family worked very hard to plant a new farm, but it was like beginning life anew, without the vigor and enthusiasm of youth, like learning to become left-handed in old age. Work no longer had, had for him the pleasure it used to have, and when there was no work to do, he sat in a silent half-sleep. His life had become had been ruled by a great passion, to become one of the lords of the clan. That had been his life-spring, and he had all but achieved it. Then everything had been broken. He had been cast out of his clan like a fish onto dry, sandy beach, panting. Clearly his personal god or chi was not made for great things. A man could not rise beyond the destiny of his chi. The saying of the elders was not true, that if a man said yea, his chi also affirmed. Here was a man whose chi said may despite his own affirmation. The old man, Uchendu, say, saw clearly that Okonkwo had yielded to despair, and he was greatly troubled. He would speak to him after the Isa Ifi ceremony. The youngest of Uchendu's five sons, Amikwu, was marrying a new wife. The bride price had been paid, and all but the last ceremony had been performed. Amikwu and his people had taken palm wine to the bride's kinsmen about two moons before Okonkwo's arrival in Mbata. And so it was time for the final ceremony of confession. The daughters of the family were all there, some of them having come a long way from their homes in distant villages. 
Uchendu's eldest daughter had come from Obodo, nearly half a day's journey away. The daughters of Uchendu's brothers were also there. It was a full gathering of Umuada, in the same way as they would meet if a death occurred in the family. There were twenty-two of them. They sat in a big circle on the ground, and the bride sat in the center with a hen in her right hand. Uchendu sat by her, holding the ancestral staff of the family. All the other men stood outside the circle watching. Their wives also watched. It was evening, and the sun was setting. Uchendu's eldest daughter, Njire, asked the questions. "'Remember that if you do not answer truthfully, you will suffer, or even die at childbirth,' she began. "'How many men have lain with you since my brother first expressed the desire to marry you?' "'None,' she answered simply. "'Answer truthfully,' urged the other women. "'None?' asked Njide. "'None,' she answered. "'Swear on this staff of my father,' said Uchendu. "'I swear,' said the bride. Uchendu took the hen from her, slit its throat with a sharp knife, and allowed some of the blood to fall on his ancestral sta staff. From that day Amiku took the young bride to his hut, and she became his wife. The daughters of the family did not return to their homes immediately, but sent, spent two or three days with their kinsmen. <clears throat> on the second day Uchendu called together his sons and daughters and his nephew Okonkwo. The men brought their goatskin mats, with which they sat on the floor, and the women sat on a sisal mat spread on a raised bank of earth. Uchendu pulled gently at his gray beard and gnashed his teeth. Then he began to speak, quietly and deliberately, picking his words with great care. "'It is Okonkwo that I primar primarily wish to speak to,' he began. "'But I want all of you to note what I am going to say. I am an old man, and you are old children.' I know more about the world than any of you. If there is any one among you who thinks he knows more, let him speak up. He paused, but no one spoke. Why is Okonkwo with us today? This is not his clan. We are only his mother's kinsmen. He does not belong here. He is an exile, condemned for seven years to live in a strange land. And so he is bowed with grief. But there is just one question I would like to ask him. Can you tell me, Okonkwo, why it is that one of the commonest names we give our children is Nike, Nika, or Mother is Supreme? We all know that a man is the head of the family, and his wives do his bidding. A child belongs to its father and his family, and not to its mother and her family. A man belongs to his fatherland, and not to his motherland. And yet we say, Nika, Mother of, is Supreme. Why is that? There was silence. I want Okonkwo to answer me, said Uchendu. I do not know the answer, Okonkwo replied. You do not know the answer. So you see that you are a child. You have many wives and many children, more than I have. You are a great man in your clan, but you are still a child, my child. Listen to me and I shall tell you. But there is one more question I shall ask you. Why is it that when a woman dies, she is taken home to be buried with her own kinsman. She is not buried with her husband's kinsman. Why is that? Your mother was brought home to me and buried with my people. Why was that? Okonkwo shook his head. He does not know that either, said Uchendu, and yet he is full of sorrow because he has come to live in his motherland for a few years. He laughed a mirthless m laughter and turned to his sons and daughters. What about you? Can you answer my question? They all shook their heads. Then listen to me, he said, and cleared his throat. <clears> throat. It's true that a child belongs to its father. But when a father beats his child, it seeks sympathy in its mother's hut. A man belongs to his fatherland when things are good and life is sweet. But when there is sorrow and bitterness, he finds refuge in his motherland. Your mother is there to protect you. She is buried there. And that is why we say that mother is supreme. Is it right that you, Okonkwo, should bring your mother a heavy face and refuse to be comforted? Be careful, or you may displease the dead. Your duty is to comfort your wives and children and take them back to your fatherland after seven years. 
but if you allow sorrow to weigh you down and kill you, they will all die in exile. He paused for a long while. These are now your kinsmen. He waved at his sons and daughters. You think you are the greatest sufferer in the world? Do you know that men are sometimes banished for life? Do you know that men sometimes lose all their yams and even their children? I had six wives once. I have none now except that young girl who knows not her right from her left. Do you know how many children I have buried? Children I begot in my youth and strength. Twenty-two. I did not hang myself, and I am still alive. If you think you are the greatest sufferer in the world, ask my daughter, Aqueni, how many twins she has born and thrown away. Have you not heard the song they sing when a woman dies? For whom it is well, for whom it is well, there is no one for whom it is well. I have no more to say to you. Chapter 15 it was in the second year of Okonkwo's exile that his friend, Obiarika, came to visit him. He brought with him two young men, each of them carrying a heavy bag on his head. Okonkwo helped them put down their loads. It was clear that the bags were full of cowries. Okonkwo was very happy to receive his friend. His wives and children were very happy, too. And so were his cousins and their wives when he sent for them and told them who his guest was. "'You must take him to salute our father,' said one of the cousins. "'Yes,' replied Okonkwo. "'We are going directly.' But before they went, he whispered something to his first wife. She nodded, and soon the children were chasing one of their cocks. Utendu had been told by one of his grandchildren that three strangers had come to Okonkwo's house. He was therefore waiting to receive them. He held out his hands to them when they came into his obi, and after they had shaken hands, he asked Okonkwo who they were. "'This is Obiariga, my great friend. I have already spoken to you about him.' "'Yes,' said the old man, turning to Obiariga. "'My son has told me about you, and I am happy you have come to see us. I know your father, Iweka. "'He was a great man. He had many friends here, and came to see them quite often. "'Those were good days, when a man had friends in distant clans.' Your generation does not know that. You stay at home, afraid of your next-door neighbor. Even a man's motherland is strange to him nowadays. He looked at Okonkwo. I am an old man, and I like to talk. That is all I am good for now. He got up painfully, went into an inner room, and came back with a cola nut. Who are the young men with you? He asked as he sat down again on his goatskin. Okonkwo told him. Ah, he said, welcome, my sons. He presented the cola nut to them, and when they had se seen it and thanked him, he broke it and they ate. "'Go into that room,' he said to Okonkwo, pointing with his finger. "'You will find a pot of wine there.' Okonkwo brought the wine, and they s began to drink. It was a day old and very strong. "'Yes,' said Uchendu, after a long silence. "'People travelled more in those days. There is not a single clan in these parts that I do not know very well. Aninta... Umuazu, Ikeocha, Ilumelu, Abame, I know them all. Have you heard, asked Obiarika, that Abame is no more? How is that? asked Uchendu and Okonkwo together. Abame has been wiped out, said Obiarika. It is a strange and terrible story. If I had not seen the few survivors with my own eyes and heard their story with my own ears, I would not have believed. Was it not on an Eke day that they fled into Umofia? he asked his two companions, and they nodded their heads. Three moons ago, said Obiarika, on an Eke market day, a little band of fugitives came into our town. Most of them were sons of our land whose mothers had been buried with us. But there were some, too, who came because they had friends in our town and others who could think of nowhere else open to escape. And so they fled into Umofia, with a woeful story. He drank his palm wine, and Okonkwo filled his horn again. He continued.
During the last planting season, a white man had appeared in their clan. An albino, suggested Okonkwo. He was not an albino. He was quite different. He sipped his wine, and he, he was riding an iron horse. The first people who saw him ran away, but he stood beckoning to them. In the end, the fearless ones went near and even touched him. The elders con consulted their oracle, and it told them that the strange man would break their clan and spread destruction among them. Obierica again drank a little of his wine, and so they killed the white man, and tied his iron horse to their sacred tree, because it looked as if it would run away to call the man's friends. I forgot to tell you another thing which the oracle said. It said that other white men were on their way. They were locusts, it said, and the first man was their harbinger sent to explore the terrain, and so they killed him. What did the white man say before they killed him? asked Uchendu. He said nothing, answered one of Obiariga's companions. He said something, only they did not understand him, said Obiariga. He seemed to speak through his nose. One of the men told me, said Obiariga's other companion, that he repeated over and over again a word that resembled Mbaino. Perhaps he had been going to Mbaino and had lost his way. Anyway, resumed Obiarica, they killed him and tied up his iron horse. This was before the planting season began. For a long time nothing happened. The rains had come and yams had been sown. The iron horse was still tied to the sacred silk cotton tree. And then one morning three white men, led by a band of ordinary men like us, came to the clan. They saw the iron horse and went away again. Most of the men and women of Obame had gone to their farms. Only a few of them saw these white men and their followers. For many market weeks nothing else happened. They have a big market in Obame on every other Afo day, and, as you know, the whole clan gathers there. That was the day it happened. The three white men and a very large number of other men surrounded the market. They must have used a powerful medicine to make themselves invisible until the market was full. And they began to shoot. Everybody was killed, except the old and the sick who were at home, and a handful of men and women whose chi were wide awake and brought them out of that market. He paused. Their clan is now completely empty. Even the sacred fish in their mysterious lake have fled, and the lake has turned to the color of blood. A great evil has come upon their land, as the oracle had warned. There was a long silence. Uchendu ground his teeth together audibly. Then he burst out. Never kill a man who says nothing! Those men of Abame were fools. What did they know about the man? He ground his teeth again, and told a story to illustrate his point. Mother Kite once sent her daughter to bring food. She went and brought back a duckling. You have done very well, said Mother Kite to her daughter. But tell me, what did the mother of this duckling say when you swooped and carried its child away? It said nothing, replied the young Kite. It just walked away. You must return the duckling, said Mother Kite. There is something ominous behind the silence. And so, daughter Kite returned the duckling and took a chick instead. What did the mother of this chick do? asked the old Kite. It cried and raved and cursed me, said the young Kite. Then we can eat the chick, said her mother. There is nothing to fear from someone who shouts. Those men of Obame were fools. Interesting. So you should fear those who are silent but you have nothing to fear from those who shout. They were fools, said Okonkwo after a pause. They had been warned that danger was ahead. They should have armed themselves with their guns and their machetes, even when they went to the market. They have paid for their foolishness, said Obierica. But I am greatly afraid. We have heard stories about white men who made the powerful guns and the strong drinks and took slaves away across the seas, but no one thought the stories were true. There is no story that is not true, said Chendu. The world has no end, and what is good among one people is an abomination with others. 
we have albinos among us do you not think that they came to our clan by mistake that they have strayed from their way to a land where everybody is like them okonkwo's first wife soon finished her cooking and set before their guests a big meal of pounded yams and bitter leaf soup okonkwo's son nwoye brought in a pot of sweet wine tapped from the raffia palm you are a big man now obierica said to nwoye your friend anene asked me to greet you is he well asked nwoye we are all well said obierica Azima brought them a bowl of water with which to wash their hands. After that they began to eat and to drink the wine. "'When did you set out from home?' asked Okonkwo. "'We had meant to set out from my house before cockcrow, said Obiarika. "'But Nweke did not appear until it was quite light. "'Never make an, your early morning appointment with a man who has just married a new wife.' They all laughed. "'Has Nweke married a wife?' asked Okonkwo. He has married Okadipo's second daughter, said Obierica. That is very good, said Okonkwo. I do not blame you for not hearing the cock crow. When they had eaten, Obierica pointed at the two heavy bags. That is the money from your yams, he said. I sold the big ones as soon as you left. Later on I sold some of the seed yams and gave out others to sharecroppers. I shall do that every year until you return, but I thought you would need the money now, and so I brought it. Who knows what may happen tomorrow? Perhaps green men will come to our clan and shoot us. God will not permit it, said Okonkwo. I do not know how to thank you. I can tell you, said Obierica. Kill one of your sons for me. That will not be enough, said Okonkwo. Then kill yourself, said Obierica. Forgive me, said Okonkwo, smiling. I shall not talk about thanking you any more. 